Thank you for joining Jennifer Shouse and Associates in our 2019 Webinar Wednesday series. We are coming to you live from downtown Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday, and you can find the upcoming schedule on our website. Past webinars and all recordings are also on our website and on our YouTube channel, along with over 160 other recordings on federal contracting topics. All are complimentary. If you have questions for our speaker today, you can email him directly with the contact information you'll see on the last slide. All right, this is just a little bit about us. We are a Washington, D.C.-based firm and provide services for federal contractors. This ranges from market analysis reports to proposal writing and also post-award compliance. More information is on our website, so please visit us there. These are a couple of upcoming events so you can find more information on our website. And we do offer newsletter advertising, so you can reach out to this email if you would like more information on that. Our speaker today is Mark Amadeo, and he's going to be covering debrief, understanding the rules, Thank you for joining us today, Mark. I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thanks, Mallory. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar. So today we're going to talk about the rules that apply to debriefs or debriefings. Now, the word debrief is not actually defined in FAR or DFARS, uh, but the FAR rule on post-award debriefings at FAR 15.506 kind of sums it up when it says that upon a timely request, offerers shall be debriefed and furnished the basis for the, the selection decision and contract award. So debriefings are an opportunity for contractors to get some kind of explanation for the selection or exclusion decision or for the contract award. Now, for most contractors, uh, the explanation serves two purposes. First, it allows a contractor to understand why its offer was not accepted. So assuming that the contractor gets uh, a constructive explanation, uh, this enables the contractor to put together a better offer next time. And the second reason that contractors request debriefings is to determine if there are adequate grounds for protesting the award. So if the explanation that an agency gives for its award decision reveals that the decision was flawed, uh, perhaps there was an, an improper consideration that was factored into the decision, for example, uh, well, that explanation may help a contractor decide whether to protest the award. Next slide, please. So when, when is a debriefing required? Uh, debriefs are required for negotiated contracts under FAR 15. Now, debriefs are also required for task or delivery orders that are over $5.5 million under indefinite delivery contracts. Next slide, please. So there are two kinds of debriefs. Uh, debriefs that occur pre-award and debriefs that occur post-award. Now, we'll, we'll touch on the pre-award debriefs first. So who is entitled to a pre-award debrief? Well, those are contractors that are excluded from the competitive range or excluded from competition before an actual award and that submit a timely debrief request. So how can they request the debrief? Well, they can do this by submitting a written request to the contracting officer, and usually um, an email will suffice. Um, and by when do they need to submit the request? Well, they need to do this within three days after receiving the notice of exclusion. And then finally, how many debriefs does a contractor get? Well, it can only get one debriefing per proposal. Next slide, please. So what are the rules uh, for the contracting officer or agency that receives a debrief request? Well, first, the contracting officer needs to hold the debriefing as soon as practicable after the request is received. Now, the contracting officer can conduct the debriefing orally, uh, which can be in person or over the phone. Uh, but the contracting officer can also conduct the debriefing in writing, uh, and this includes sending an email with, with all of the required debrief contents. Uh, but the contracting officer can also um, basically use any other method of communication as well. However, the contracting officer communicates the debrief uh, 
um, the debrief has to have at a minimum three things. One, an evaluation of the significant aspects of the offer's proposal. Number two, a summary of the rationale for eliminating the offer from the competition. And number three, reasonable responses to relevant questions like whether the procedures that were contained in the solicitation were actually followed. Next slide, please. So there are things that a contracting officer cannot reveal during a pre-award debriefing. And those include the number of offers, uh, the identity of other offers, uh, the content of other offers proposals, um, the ranking of other offers, the evaluation of other offers proposals, and any information that is prohibited from disclosure under FAR 15.506E during the post-award debrief. Uh, and we'll talk about that information in just a bit. Next slide, please. So that brings us to post-award debriefs. Who is entitled to a post-award debrief? Well, any offer, uh, whether it is successful or unsuccessful, that submits a timely request. And how do they request it? Well, again, uh, they can request it by writing to the agency. And again, this can be done uh, by email. So what is the deadline for the request? Um, it must be received by the agency within three days after the date the offer received the award notification. Um, now we just said that any offer can request a post-award debrief. Well, there's an exception. Um, if an offer was notified of its exclusion from competition, but did not file a timely pre-award request, well, that offer is not entitled to a post-award debriefing. Now that's not to say that it shouldn't ask for one anyway. Um, it should because the agency may, may still uh, accommodate an untimely debriefing request even though the offer is not entitled to it. Next slide, please. So getting to post-award ru rules that apply to contracting officers. First, uh, to the maximum extent practicable, the debrief should occur within five days after the receipt of the written request. And like pre-award debriefs, post-award debriefs can be made orally, uh, in writing, and really any other method that's acceptable to the contracting officer. Next slide, please. And like with pre-award debriefs, post-award debriefs must include certain information. And that includes an evaluation of significant weaknesses or deficiencies, uh, an overall evaluated cost or price, and any technical ratings if they're applicable. Uh, unlike pre-award debriefs, on post-award, agencies can and must provide an overall ranking of all offers if the agency actually ranked the offers. The agency must also provide a summary of the rationale for the award. Uh, and for commercial items, the agency must uh, identify uh, the make and model of the item that's gonna be delivered by the successful offerer. And agencies must provide reasonable responses uh, to relevant questions such as whether uh, the selection procedures were actually followed. Next slide, please. Now we said before that during a pre-award debrief, the agency can't reveal the same kind of information that is prohibited from disclosure during post-award debriefs. So what is that information? Well, first off, uh, the post-award debrief will not be a point-by-point -point comparison of all of the proposals. Um, now, as for the information that can't be disclosed, uh, that information is information that is exempt from FOIA or the Freedom of Information Act. And those are things like trade secrets, uh, privileged or confidential manufacturing processes and techniques, uh, commercial and financial information that's privileged or confidential. And these are things like cost breakdowns or profits uh, and indirect cost rates. And the debriefing cannot disclose the names of the individuals that provided reference information about an offer's past performance. Next slide, please. So debriefings uh, 
often will have an impact on the deadline for filing protests. Now, a full discussion of bid protests is beyond the scope of this presentation. But I will say, while we're talking about protests, that generally a debriefing itself is not a basis for a protest. Um, debriefings are not evaluative decisions. They're only explanations of the decisions. So if there's an error in the explanation or a contractor is not happy with how the debrief was con conducted, um, well, but there isn't an error in the underlying decision, uh, then there is not a basis for a protest. Um, now, with regard to protest deadlines, uh, we'll start with protests that are filed with an agency. So for protests that are based on solicitation irregularities, uh, there's a straightforward um, static deadline for submitting the protest, which is uh, the date of the bid opening or the closing date of the receipt of the proposals. So debriefings don't impact those deadlines. But for all other protests that are filed with an agency, the deadline for filing a protest is um, within 10 days after the basis for the protest is known or should have been known, whichever is earlier. Now, often the basis for a decision uh, will be revealed only during a debriefing. So the 10 day period won't begin to run uh, in those cases until the debriefing happens. But sometimes a contractor becomes aware of a basis for the protest before the debriefing. Now, if so, the 10 day period will begin to run before the debriefing and it could even expire before the debriefing happens. So there's no explicit extension that says the 10 day period uh, is on hold until the debriefing happens. And in fact, there's a warning under FAR 33 that states that a delayed debriefing could affect the timeliness of a protest that's filed after the debriefing. So contractors may sometimes need to start preparing their, uh, their protests before the agency debriefing occurs. Now, as for protests that are filed with GAO, uh, the deadline for non-solicitation protests also is not later than 10 days after the basis for a protest is known or should have been known, whichever is earlier. But unlike with agency protests, there is an exception to this rule if the procurement is one for which a debriefing is required to be given after a timely request. Now, in those instances, the protest can be filed up to 10 days after the date on which the debriefing is held. Now, this exception uh, applies regardless of whether or not the basis for the protest was known before the debriefing. Now, we said this exception um, only applies when a debriefing is required to be given upon request. So when are debriefings not required to be given? Well, debriefs are not required for uh, commercial item procurements, uh, for GSA schedule procurements, for simplified acquisition procurements, and for sealed bid acquisitions. So in those instances, the 10-day protest deadline period won't be put on hold uh, if the agency voluntarily uh, decides to hold a debriefing or some kind of explanation of the award decision because it's not required or mandatory. Next slide, please. Now, lastly, uh, because the deadlines for submitting protests can be can depend on the debrief, debrief date, uh, it's important to know when a debriefing actually ends. Now, sometimes there will be some back and forth after the debriefing uh, between the agency and the contractor. Uh, for example, if the contractor submits follow-up questions. Well, the general rule is that the debrief is considered concluded at the end of the debrief session unless the agency makes clear that the debriefing session is being extended. So this general rule applies regardless of whether or not there's ongoing correspondence or follow-up questions. But there's an exception to this general rule uh, for the briefings of decisions by DOD agencies. Uh, in 2018, DOD issued a class deviation uh, that said that contracting officers have to give unsuccessful offers to business days to submit additional questions. The agencies then have five days after receipt of the questions to respond in writing. And the debriefing is not considered concluded until all of those responses are delivered. So naturally, this extended debriefing schedule 
will have an impact on the 10-day deadline for filing a protest with GAO, which again does not begin to run until the debrief is conducted. Well, that's all I have for my presentation. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And if you have any questions, my information is up there on the next slide. Thank you, Mark, for sharing your knowledge and insight today. Today's presentation has been recorded and can be found on our website or YouTube channel within about 48 hours. If you have questions about today's topic, please contact Mark at the phone number or email shown on your screen. Thank you, everybody. This concludes the webinar.